You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 59. Well, welcome back, Curd Nerds. I'm Gavin Webber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. I nearly lost my breath then. So excited to be here. Um, this week, I was going to take a break from the podcast because today, the day I'm recording, which is Wednesday, because you get to listen to it on Thursday mornings, Australian Eastern Standard Time, it is my 20th wedding anniversary. And uh, I've been out all day with my wife. We've been visiting the countryside around here and we had a lovely lunch out. Uh, we didn't have any cheese, unfortunately, um, but we are going to go away for the weekend. And upon arrival, we're going to have a lovely cheese platter, which I'm going to take some photos of and do a blog post about and maybe even a little YouTube video. So that should be very interesting. Anyway, this week's email questions are from Ask the Cheesemaker, episode 10 and 11. And after we've got through those, we've got a couple of voicemails um, that I'm going to play and answer the questions to. Anyway, so let's get on with the show. The first question is from Leah Bear from YouTube. Leah asks, Gavin, can cheese be made from milk treated to be lactose free? Or is the lactose necessary for the bacteria to breed? Well, that is a good question, Leah. Um, and I do get that on many occasions on the channel. Well, the answer is only a few cheeses can be made with lactose-free milk. And a few that come to mind are ricotta, uh, paneer, and quick mozzarella. Or mozzarella, 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 that's right. I've been told off many times for saying it wrong. Now, you can make any cheese, basically, that is acid set or uses acid to separate the curds and whey. Now, any cheese that is rennet set will probably not work because it needs to be um, uh, acidified using a starter culture, and the starter culture... Uh, needs to convert the lactose in the milk into lactic acid, which aids the rennet to set. So try some of those cheeses. Hopefully they will work out for you. Now, just before I move on to the next question, I actually had an email during the week, and it was from a well-known cheese maker and cheese educator here in Australia called Carol Wilman. Now, Carol reached out to me, reached out, is that the right word? A, a roach down? No, that's not right. Um, and she reached out to me during the week and uh, and just gave me some more information around lactose-free milk. So here's some information she provided for me, which is really good. And it's great how uh, fellow cheese-making educators help each other out here around here. Um, so I'm quite happy to read this out. So lactose is a disaccharide, saccharide, uh, made up of two simple sugars called glucose and galactose. So people who have problems digesting lactose are not producing the enzyme lactase, which converts the disaccharide into its two component sugars. So lact a lactose-free milk is produced by adding the enzyme lactase to the milk. So the resultant milk is not sugar-free, but has glucose and galactose in place of the lactose. So starters in cheesemaking are generally, generally able to use glucose and galactose as their source of nutrient. In fact, mostly they will convert the lactose into glucose and galactose and then convert either one or both of these simple sugars into lactic acid. In the absence of other sugars, cheese starters can also ferment sucrose, which is common sugar, which is why you are able to make soy yogurt since soy does not contain lactose and most soy drinks have added sugar. 
Most lactose-free milk is homogenised, and this is more of a problem for cheesemaking than the lack of lactose. The lactase enzyme is available from chemists in Australia and can be, ma- and can be added to any milk to make it lactose-free. Well, there you go. Thank you very much to Carol, um, who um, reached out and sent that through to help out. I had it half right, I think, but uh, that certainly has tipped the balance in the favour that anybody who has issues with, uh, with lactose intolerance, then you can make cheeses that are lactose-free, or they have split the sugar, lactose, into its two subcomponent sugars. So there you go. Get stuck into it, cheesemakers. Uh, no excuse for being lactose intolerant anymore that you can't eat these cheeses. So get stuck into it. Anyway, back on with the email questions. Uh, the next question is from Bob from Mandeville in Louisiana. And Bob asks, Gavin, when waxing cheese, what temperature range is best for the wax? Should the melted wax in the pot be cooled a bit before applying it to the cheese and applying a second coat. Well, um, let me have a think about that. Um, oh, thanks for your question, first of all, Bob. Uh, yeah, look, the answer is that the wax should be heated to uh, 92 degrees Celsius, which is about 197 Fahrenheit, to kill off any moulds or bacterias. And then the cheese either dipped into the wax or the wax brushed on uh, quickly. Now, what I do to speed up the process is I place the actual wheel of cheese into the fridge to cool it down for about 30 minutes. And that basically um, helps the wax to cool quicker on the first um, dipping or first coat. And it also helps it you to be able to hold it to apply the second coat a lot uh, faster. So there's some quick tips on how to wax your cheese a lot faster. Don't forget to uh, to heat it up to that higher temperature. It kills it off the bacteria off a lot a lot uh, a lot better. Uh, the last question is from Santiago in Hong Kong. Now Santiago says. Last night I opened for the second time a waxed half red Leicester that he tasted at one month that was bland, was acid leaking, had whey issues. Three weeks later, the same thing, a real disappointment. Uh, It was very bland and a bit acidic. Sounds like a bit of a disaster, San Diego. Uh, He tried a Gouda at 10 weeks. Uh, It was a bit moist and normal it does not melt uh, had a slight acidic taste and had vague flavors of gouda i have another whole gouda of the same age which he will mature for another two months okay fair enough so his question is should i backpack them now and Uh, leave them on to mature? Will they improve with time? Oh, he goes on to say, thanks for everything, Uh, your book, the videos, your podcast, and uh, recipes on littlegreencheese.com. Oh, thanks, Santiago. That's lovely. Now, I think you've got a a couple of issues. Uh, I think you may have a salt issue, actually. Um, You may need to add a little bit more salt when you're milling your Lester. Uh, and leave your gouda in the brine a bit longer. It sounds like uh, that you're having the the sorry the culture is being a bit overzealous. So add an extra half a tablespoon for the Lester, and let the gouda sit in the brine for about another three hours. So it's actually the salt that helps control the acidity. Um, the acidity is caused by overzealous lactic bacteria during maturation. So make sure that, yeah, you, you've salted your, your cheeses properly because they will continue to fent, ferment because salt is the, um, it slows down the maturation. So also make sure that your temperatures are spot on during production. 
and that when it's when you're asked to increase your temperatures uh, during the cooking of the curd, make sure that it's slow. So you go from the lower temperature, the higher temperature over the correct period of time. This is because if the curd forms a rind quickly, it'll lock in the acid within the curd and that can also cause a high acid content and cause bitterness as well. I don't think these cheeses are going to improve any because of the acidity issue that you've mentioned there. Sorry about that, Santiago. I don't think they're going to be saved. Okay, so the patron of the week is Anne Reed. Thank you, Anne, for your support. Uh, it's wonderful uh, that you've reached out and uh, supported me financially on the channel. The first question today is from Chuck. That's by email. He writes, Gavin, I have a Jarlsberg that seems to be ready to be opened. It has, oh, sorry, it was waxed at the beginning of November and it was bought out at room temperature on uh, December the 1st. It is swelling quite nicely, requiring repairs three times so far. I seem to have bad luck of poorly aged cheeses. When do I cut off the wax? Well, thanks, Chuck. Yalesburg style cheese is best ripened, as you probably know from reading the recipe, at 16 to 18 Celsius, which is 60 to 64 Fahrenheit, for about six weeks. Any warmer, then the eyes will develop quickly and you may only need about four weeks. If the eye development starts getting out of control, then you can put it back into your cheese fridge uh, and lower the temperature down back to about 13 degrees Celsius and that'll slow the eye development down. Now you can continue to mature that at that lower temperature for the, the, the normal period of, of the, the six weeks. Now, a tip for cheese makers in warmer climates, if you're going to make this style of cheese in summer, don't, basically. It's just too hard to keep the temperature uh, down low. Unless you've got a separate fridge, that you can keep at a lower a lower temperature than your than your other kitchen fridge or higher than your normal cheese fridge. Personally, I make it during the autumn or the winter or in spring. Our house normally during those three seasons is roughly about sixteen to eighteen degrees because we don't have heating on and we've got double glazing. Anyway, there's some tips. Well, the next question is from Bill via email. Now, Bill asks, Gavin, perhaps you can tell me why all my hard cheeses, uh, Colby, Farmhouse Cheddar and Monterey Jack, are all crumbly when I cut them. I have been using the packet of Direct Set Cheese Culture, one packet per two gallons of milk. I salt brined both the Colby and the Monterey Jack and they still crumbling okay um, any information would be appreciated okay no problems bill um, sounds very crumbly now very crumbly cheese is a sign that the curd was cooked at uh, too high a temperature or that the curd was stirred for too long and it lost too much whey now, a simple test for that is to take a handful of your curds um, partway through stirring and uh, gently squeeze them into a ball. Now, if they don't fall apart straight away, and then you can press your finger into the, the little curd ball, or your thumb, sorry, into the little curd ball, and it breaks apart easily, then it's ready to press for those type of cheeses that you mentioned. Um, and I guarantee you that those cheeses will not be crumbly. So those type of hard cheeses, that's a very simple test to try. Okay, uh, the last question is from uh, Diane Thomas via email. Now, Diane writes, Hi Gavin, I bought some white Stilton with bits of apricot in it at Trader Joe's here in Oregon. 
It is delicious and I am going to make some white Stilton tomorrow, leaving out the blue. My question is, when would you add the dried apricot bits? Uh, not when you would normally have added the blue because they would sink to the bottom of the pot, but rather at the time of milling the salt. Is this what you would do? Help, in big letters, uh, from a newbie curd nerd who jumps in with both feet, sterilised, of course. Lol. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, thanks for your very interesting question, Diane. Um, yes, what I would do is, and it's a very interesting cheese, White Stilton, because it has the creaminess of the Blue Stilton, of course, without the Penicillium Roque 40. So what you do, the milling stage is perfect for adding dried apricots. So what you need to do is steam about half a cup of chopped dried fruit for about 10 minutes to plump them up and to sterilize them so there's no molds or bacteria on the fruit and then just add uh, it to the curd just before milling uh, sorry just before filling the mold um, so remember that the dried fruit will rehydrate rehydrate a little more in the during the aging uh, and it may cause the paste to dry out a little more so just just be aware of that. So hopefully that answers your question, and thanks for that one, Diane. Uh, the patron of the week is Tim Organo. Thanks very much for your support, Tim. Now, if you were woo 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 woo, now if you would like to support this podcast and my YouTube channel and all the great cheese making education tools that I produce for free, then uh, pop over to littlegreencheese.com slash support and you'll be sent over to my Patreon channel, or Patreon page, sorry, where you'll be able to pledge your financial support for my ongoing work uh, in this field. Anyway, let's get on with the voicemail question, shall we? Okay, the first one is from John from Denmark. Hi, Gavin. John from Denmark. I have a question regarding the use of cow's milk and using a mix of skimmed milk and 38% pure cream. Those two items are unhomogenized. Will I gain anything by mixing the skimmed milk and 38% cream? so that it has the same fat content as normal cow's milk. I think that the skimmed milk and the cream using that as a mix will be a bit more expensive. So my question is, do I get anything from using those two items instead of using the normal cow's milk? Thank you, Gavin, for this. Thank you for all your great videos. Please continue your great job. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure as always, John. Thank you for your question, mate. Now, if I get you right, you have got your hands on a source of unhomogenized skimmed milk or semi-skim milk and unhomogenized cream. And you want to put the two together and make unhomogenized full cream milk or whole milk at about... Or 4%, I would think, you'd probably come out with. You'd have to adjust it, of course, uh, and figure it out somehow. Um, yeah, you would probably get a, a milk that is unhomogenized. It may be pasteurized if, uh, I'm not sure, you didn't mention that at all. But you would certainly get a milk that would set a, a very good curd. And it probably would have a very high fat content and it would make a very nice cheese. So if it is a bit more expensive than regular milk that is pasteurised and uh, homogenised, then you're probably still worth doing what you're thinking of doing, and that's getting the two separate and putting them together. So that'd be well worth it. I certainly would give it a go personally myself, um, just as an experiment you know, to start with uh, and trying to make a simple cheese out of it. You know, one of the semi... Um, 
semi-hard cheeses, maybe a Gouda or Edam or something like that. That'd be great. But yeah, give that a go and see how you go. But yeah, I, I think it'd be worth it personally. But uh, I'll leave that up to you, of course. Anyway, the next question is from Amanda in Alaska. Welcome back, Amanda. Now, where did my cursor go? There it is. Hi, Gavin. It's Amanda in Homer, Alaska again. Um, I had a question about smoking cheese. I was interested in maybe trying that. And I was wondering if you would age the cheese first and then smoke it, or if you would smoke it and then wax it and age it. I'm guessing that you would smoke it first and then age it, but I wasn't sure. Anyways, thanks, and I'm really enjoying your podcast still. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank you very much, Amanda, and it's a pleasure as always. I recently saw on the Cheesemaker Help blog, the one run by New England Cheesemaking Supply Company, they did a, an article on three methods of smoking cheese. Uh, one was cold smoking, uh, one was adding, uh, one was rubbing uh, liquid smoke and then cold smoking, and then the other one was adding liquid smoke. Now, I have had some recent experience on this, and I have added liquid smoke to one of my uh, chowder, uh, not gow, a gouda, as I just mentioned before, that's the Aussie way of saying it. Um, so, yeah, I added some. Uh, some uh, liquid smoke, and that seems to be working. I vacuum-packed the chowder the other day, and uh, I'm waiting for that to mature in a, a few months' time. See how that turns out. Definitely has a smoky flavour, and, and you can smell it in the cheese. I uh, can't smell it through the plastic um, seal, but you can smell it. The article that I read, it mentioned that you cold smoke the cheeses when they're mature, if I remember rightly, hang on, I'll just check. Yes, I just read the whole article again. And uh, yes, cold smoking, you must have, sorry, the cheese must be mature. So cheeses that they recommend is, uh, hang on, let me just check again. Uh, cheddar, howder, mozzarella, provolone, scamosa, uh, Swiss and pepper jack are some other popular ones that people are smoking. Uh, and some fresh cheeses as well. So Capri, which is a, um, a small goat's log, a uh, bit like a, a sherve. Um, so, yeah, so, um, and they're hickory smoked as well. So they're cold smoked. So I will put a link to that article into the show notes. Um, so check out for, uh, check out that in uh, the show notes, Amanda. So hopefully that has helped cold smoke or add liquid smoke and uh, and you will have a very lovely smoky flavour to your cheese. Anyway, thank you very much for your question once again. The next one actually is hot off the presses. It just came in about three minutes ago. Is from John Miller. I'll just play that now. Okay, so I just want to say greetings from across the pond. Um... I appreciate all your videos. Very helpful. I just had a question about uh, sheep's milk. The only way I may be able to get it is frozen. And I really want to make some Pecorino Romano. So I was wondering, what would you do if you got it frozen? How would you go about the frosting? it? And again, uh, greetings. And thanks for all that you do. Uh, thank you very much, John. Well, that was actually John Miller Sr. Now, John, I have had some experience. I received some raw cow's milk from a friend in Tasmania and uh, she froze the milk to bring it over and brought it over in some uh, cooling boxes or chilli boxes in New Zealand and eskies here in Australia. And I had read somewhere that you couldn't use frozen milk to make cheese and I said, well first source of raw milk I ever had, I'm going to give it a go anyway. And it did work. It worked no problems at all. There was a little bit of cream floating on top. And I've, look, since I've started buying unhomogenized milk from the store, I've had exactly the same experience and that milk hasn't been frozen. Now, because sheep's milk has a higher fat content and the fat globules are a lot smaller 
similar to goat's milk, uh, you probably won't have any issues using frozen sheep's milk. So, but really, the only way to and I've, I've checked about four of my cheese making books that have no reference whatsoever about using frozen milk, uh, defrosting it. But what I would do, and what I did, was simply put the uh, the frozen milk into a pot, put it into the fridge to let it to defrost at uh, four degrees Celsius, a normal fridge, fifty five Fahrenheit. I believe you're over in the the US. I can't tell. So let it defrost at that temperature. Uh, you'll see it slowly defrost, uh, and then once it's in liquid form, just slowly heat it up to the target temperature and away you go, start cheese making. So that's my recommended way of using frozen sheep's milk. Give it a go. If it works, fantastic. I'd love to hear back from you and uh, it would uh, it would be lovely if you could share that with all the listeners on the podcast. Um, thanks for your call, uh, John. Oh, I didn't have a sheep, but that was close enough. That was a cow. Now, we've got some uh, upcoming workshops in uh, April, April 5th and 6th. We've got some beginner cheese-making workshops in Melton. If you're in Victoria or anywhere else in Australia and you feel the urge to travel to my uh, three cheese workshop, um, check out littlegreencheese.com and uh, you can see the uh, workshop um, in the title bar and uh, click through and you'll get the workshop dates and how to book and all that good information. You can also see a copy of my cheese making ebook. Keep calm and make cheese <laughs> in PDF format and uh, or in all the good ebook stores. Thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next exciting episode of Little Green Cheese Podcast. During the show, you heard music by Kevin McLeod, you heard Malt Shop Bop, and Call to the Dairy Cows. Thanks for listening, everybody, and don't forget that you can send in voicemail questions just by visiting littlegreencheese.com and clicking through to the contact page or the sidebar widget on the right-hand side if you're using a desktop browser. Thanks again. See you later.